Okay, our final uh, keynote speaker is Don DeAngelis, who will be talking about ecological applications of agent based models. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I especially thank uh, James for inviting me. I, I have to confess that before this, I didn't know anything about CSDMS, and uh, I've learned a lot in the last few days, and I'm very happy I have. So, uh, I think my purpose was to, to give a, a sort of an overview of agent based models. I know a lot of you know quite a bit about them. Uh, some of you may not know. Uh, and I'm going to do it as follows. A slight overview, uh, sort of an introduction. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, agent based models, modeling in the following areas, which I, I think will be kind of relevant to uh, uh, what, what you're interested in. So I think that uh, the situation is successful. We're really uh, it got started. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the, the importance of spatially explicit ABMs uh, for a particular system, the Savannah system, as an example. Then I'll talk about uh, core spatial dynamics, in particular the problem of scaling up. That's the real problem that uh, people are trying to deal with. Then uh, a little bit about vegetation change along all uh, these ingredients. Climate change, interactions with vegetation, uh, sharp vegetation boundaries, regime shifts. If I get to these, uh, invading living species and biocontrol and biodiversity. I, if I can talk fast, I'll uh, get through all of those, but I'm not sure. That was a pretty, pretty big uh, burrito today. So, uh, so, in any case, what are Asian based models? Uh, a similar population or communities is being composed of discrete interacting individuals or agents. And in economics, uh, for instance, this is a very general type of model. It could be households, firms, uh, social groups, or a lot of other things. Uh, and the uh, sets of traits may vary among the, the agents. The ABM, ABMs can range from very simple to highly complex. Uh, it can include things like details of visual, visual life cycle, physiological state, adaptive behavior, learning, etc. And explicit spatial locations on a heterogeneous landscape and if the animals movement. Local interactions in space are important, but may be more important than uh, you know, overall interactions with the mean population. Various types of stochasticity, uh, using Monte Carlo simulations, we do many replicates of uh, simulations. And, and you can incorporate genetics and do uh, evolution over generations. So, uh, if you really want to learn a lot, uh, I'd recommend two books. First by Grim and Erlsbach, Individual Based Modern. We used to call this Individual Based Modern. I think it uh, isn't based as uh, one out, but that's okay. And then they, they later on, they adapted as you face. This is a how-to handbook, whereas this is a really a, a philosophical overview of the, uh, the examples and so forth. So, very good, very good pair of books. And they, they strongly, uh, one of their main points is the key aspect of the ABMs is they're bottom-up rather than top-down. That is, the properties of population, community, and ecosystem level emerge from interaction with individuals, and not forced. And that makes a big difference. Uh, I thought I'd split this in. Uh, in 2005, I did kind of a uh, uh, sampling of papers using the, using the uh, search uh, individual based in the literature just to see what was happening. And, and I noticed back in the well, two things that emerged from this. Back in 1990, there were virtually no uh, papers that, uh, you know, that had individual based. And it's gone up pretty steadily. And you also noticed that there are a whole lot of different uh, topics. So a lot of different taxa have been covered by individual based models. Nowadays, this is saying, you know, 11 years later, I wouldn't even attempt to see those in literature. And I think uh, uh, for each of these uh, 
topics. You can write a whole book on uh, the models that have been developed. In any case, I'm going to start out by talking about uh, applications of education succession dynamics. And so the idea of the ADM at a college goes back to Dan Buck in the early 1970s. He had computer simulations of tree dynamics in the forest gap, that's what he called gap models. Uh, and was, each tree was, was modeled. You start, start here with a gap that's created by either it could die or some sort of disturbance. New seedlings move in. There's growth, competition, uh, hitting, until you get back to maybe one or two individuals, they die, and they start over again. Oh, that's kind of boring. I, I mean, but I'll tell you, at that time, in 1972, when I saw Dan's talk, it was pretty electrifying uh, because we hadn't thought about modeling things this way. We used space variable models, and we thought that was all we could do. Dan had the brilliant idea of modeling things individual by individual in the interactions. So, and there's Dan. Uh, this individual based model is called Zabala. And, and basically, it simulates plant succession, succession on a 0.01 hectare plot using plant life history characteristics and environmental conditions. The main processes are yearly growth, mortality, reproduction. And there's a package you can buy to buy it for. You can do these things. It's very easy. It's uh, very nice. Now, to get into a little more detail, uh, the input data, site data like climate, radiation, soil type, nitrogen, moisture conditions, and these are all modifiers of the maximum growth rate of trees. Then the tree data on each of the tree species, maximum growth rate, maximum diameter, maximum height, maximum age, possible sapling reproduction per year, and the tolerances to drought, flooding, shade, nutrient tolerance. You know, it's more data, but uh, for a lot of tree species, that's, that's approximately well known. Uh, it's approximated. Uh, I put uh, the simulated forest plot, and for each species, the density, the number of trees per hectare, basal area, uh, total biomass, and size structure. I get a lot of information out of that. The way it works is basically it's competition for light. Taller trees shade the smaller ones. The degree of shading influences growth. The running average of annual growth is kept in the model. The probability of mortality of a tree increases if it's running average on growth is low. Well, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of the, the basics. Uh, a couple of more things I had to say. Uh, it's not really spatially structured. The trees in, within this 0.01 height to plot don't have a location. They're kind of mixed. Competition for light is simulated by adding shading effects of all trees in the gap. So it's kind of smeared out. So it's kind of spatial, but it's not real spatial. We'll get to, we'll get to, that, to that later. And there's an external and or internal input of feelings. So what you get out of this is uh, simulations of succession. Starting, and this is, uh, this is the original simulations we did, starting with our uh, early uh, succession of species, yellow boots. And this is for low elevations in uh, New England. Yellow boots is eventually uh, outcompeted by some more shade tolerant beaches and sugar maples. Higher elevation, uh, it's the uh, white boots, which is uh, eventually outshaded by, uh, I think it's the red spruce, which becomes dominant. Very pretty simple. This was a pretty simple uh, demonstration, but uh, very, very interesting. And uh, among the people that, uh, like myself, was electrified by it was Hank Schubert. Uh, he did uh, he developed the Corey model, and they did a lot of models everywhere in the world by now. But uh, this is a secondary succession in the Southern Appalachians. And you get into output like this, which is actually percentage of the species of various types through time, over 500 years. Usually, five, uh, pioneer species dominated, but through time, uh, mostly oak species, and then some uh, maples and beaches 
come in. So, and this stuff can be calibrated with some data. There's a lot of data on forests of different ages, forest plants. You can, you can calibrate and then test these models. They've been pretty well tested uh, all over the world. So that's kind of it for uh, the gap, these gap models. We're going to see, we're see soon how, how these are extended into uh, bigger spatial areas. Uh, before I do that, I want to uh, talk a little bit about savanna systems just to give you a, a, a reason why I think these, these models are very important. So, uh, and I want to contrast uh, a top, the top down model approach with these spatially explicit ABMs. So, uh, the top down models are sometimes called spatially, they're, they're often they're usually spatially implicit. Uh, and they're useful, they're very useful. Now, I do that sort of stuff myself, but they don't tell the whole story. So, to give an example, recent paper by Stoker and San Levin, uh, modeling uh, a savanna system with four components grass, savanna saplings, savanna trees, and forest trees, as there's four differential equations. And uh, they, they include things like uh, reproduction rate, mortality, competition. Uh, and these things, all of these rate coefficients are functions of, of, uh, of precipitation. So you can solve these things. You can solve these things through steady state or either uh, analytically or numerically. And, and then, you can, then you can look at uh, the, the steady state that you get as a function of the uh, rainfall gradient. We did it for six cases that have different assumptions on the effect of rainfall on tree life history. And what you get is something like this along the gradient. Uh, the very low rainfall, grass is going to dominate. For, as you get higher, though, you get into cases where you can get uh, a, a bistability cases where you have alternative stable uh, states, such as uh, that could be uh, with the grass or savanna trees, plus saplings, plus grass. And you could just look at levels of assumption you get these various things. And high enough rainfall, you're going to get forest trees plus, uh, plus a little bit of grass. And it says a lot. So you can really learn a lot from these things and see what, uh, uh, what you can, can expect uh, in a savanna system across uh, a rainfall gradient. The problem is this ignores possible effects of local interactions that are not really incorporated. A lot of them are not really incorporated. Spatial interactions that aren't incorporated in this model. And so ABMs then reveal the importance of microscale mechanisms. What top-down approaches miss are the local spatial interactions, such as positive feedback facilitation that can promote clustering. And so this is one of the main mechanisms that, uh, that can cause uh, these changes in systems. Corey and Yelts, uh, for example, asked, asked the question, is what, what maintains a, uh, a savanna system uh, which may have a tendency to, to, to go either to a, uh, a, a pure forest system or a pure, pure grassland rather than savanna. Uh, so we started doing these simulations, starting with uh, a scattering, a random scattering of, uh, of trees. Uh, and you included this positive feedback facilitation. If you get a, a small cluster of trees together, what they do is they can, they can facilitate recruitment of new trees. Uh, uh, they can protect the seedlings from fire because they, sit, they, uh, they compete out the uh, local grass. So if you do that, and you start to get little clusters, those clusters can grow and in time dominate the system. That can, that can happen if there's a low frequency of fires. These are, these are fire dominated systems. So if the frequency of fires is low enough, the trees and shrubs can take over. So on the other hand, if, it, if fires are very really frequent, uh, the system can go in the other way and you can get reversion to complete grassland. So you realize this the sensitivity of this system and the, the basic mechanisms that, that can cause it to go one way or another. Uh, now, what we found is that by high enough frequency of fires, the right frequency of fires, uh, 
to, to kill some of the seedlings that are some distance from these clumps, you can maintain a savanna of mixed grass, shrubs, and trees. So, you know, clumps of trees, uh, shrubs, in a uh, matrix of uh, grass. In, in this, uh, this takes other conditions also. It takes certain uh, relations of the, uh, the, the uh, ability of the trees to uh, compete or facilitate uh, uh, recruitment. So, there are a lot of things involved, but basically, uh, with the right balance of uh, how far you can get this, you can get a maintain savanna. Uh, now, this was taken further by Calabrese, using this, it was basically an elaboration of the same model, with uh, including both tree tree competition and local facilitation. He showed that low fire frequency, in this case, creates a regular distribution of trees, medium frequency creates a random distribution, low fire frequency. I should say that's a high fire frequency, which sorry, creates a, uh, a clump distribution. So we can get into more of these details. Uh, uh, the, uh, mechanism. Uh, another uh, is that life history also matters. Uh, trees have different life histories and different uh, uh, strategies for, for surviving in a savanna system. One is fire resistance, piece of bark. Fire avoidance due to rapid gro early growth to less fire vulnerable strata stations, least sprouting from less vulnerable underground components. Uh, Acatino et al. modeled uh, savanna systems in which uh, we had trees that were neither of these three types uh, simulated the fact that they're able to uh, invade the savanna system, but they all did it in somewhat different ways. These plots. So, uh, tree density, uh, fraction of burn cells, and grass density as a function of time after the trees have got invaded. They're all different. It, uh, and what this shows, uh, okay, and what this shows is that uh, uh, trees with different uh, uh, strategies, uh, it's basically the importance of taking into account these uh, uh, ABMs. Uh, I'm going to skip over these things. I think because I didn't realize time was going quite so fast. Uh, local, uh, another aspect of uh, uh, spatial pattern are, are these well known uh, large spatial patterns in semi arid lands. And these have been understood through partial difference, equa difference of equations, Turing or Gero Meinhard equations. Uh, that's very nice. So that's what those are top down equations. But it's also been shown by uh, Jeffy that if you take into account uh, local interactions with these top down equations, that they take into account, you can get quite different outcomes. Instead of these very nice patterns, you get these fairly uh, uh, more fractal appearing uh, patterns. Jeffy, for a second, it was going to have to go through very fast. Models, uh, uh, as I said, the bow and foray are only partially spatial. Competition is average, so they don't take into account actual position of trees. Uh, sorting, modeled by Canem and Akala, does. And so, in this case, each of these trees is, is interacting with the trees in this local uh, area. And they're different. The, the number of different uh, models that do the same are, are like sorting, that, there's, that they, they have this spatial explicitness within the uh, area. And they, have, they make different assumptions on how uh, white, how, how plants shade each other. So there are a lot of different variations on this. The important result of sorting, sorting predicts standing stock of forest spatial area very close to field data. The model based on mean field, no horizontal variation, that is no internal uh, heterogeneity, uh, predicts only half of this biomass. So there's some important things about keeping, in, keeping track of the, uh, uh, of the details. Sail into larger areas, which I wanted to take more time on, uh, I'll just talk about that very 
quickly, fortune covers only areas of the order of hectare, so to scale up to larger uh, landscape issues, it's necessary to uh, go up to much larger areas. But it's important also to keep as much of the ABM gap approach as, as possible. Now, there are models like the dynamic global vegetation models that cover very large areas. The problem is, and they're very good, but they miss the local scale interactions such as competition and facilitation that may have nonlinear effects. There are approaches to scaling up for one mosaic by uh, Leo, Leo and Ashton. Does this they model go all the way from the tree up to uh, forest, small forest areas up to whole regions? That is, 10 to the 6 hectares by combining these small 10 by 10 cells to uh, the only connected by seed dispersal. Landis by, by uh, Modena does the same thing. And this includes the fire module and the field module, so that you can look at things like the effects that you can model fires. Uh, the effects of uh, fires on, uh, on different tree species, maples, uh, oaks, uh, a fire allows aspens to, to come in. So he does that over very large landscapes. Tropical forests, again, this is a ecosystem demography model by Warcraft and others scaling up. Very detailed uh, physiology at the plant level. And we can predict biomasses, compare uh, biomasses at this uh, large scales using one by one uh, 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 degree uh, cells. And prediction of soil, carbon stocks as well. So we can change, I mean, I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, uh, models of, uh, of uh, uh, land, land clean is another model that has been used to uh, model tree species along elevation uh, gradients. And one thing I do want to uh, make sure I talk about is, uh, is climate change. Large parts of Siberia, large forests are susceptible to change the climate warming. And this is uh, from, uh, this is work by Sugar and his students. Uh, warming may cause replacement of large by evergreen conifers. And, and this is also a, a very wide area. They, they've uh, applied their gap model for us to far east to uh, 372 sites. Showing that as over time, as temperature goes up according to uh, various scenarios, larch is going to be replaced by, by spruce in many of these sites. So, so over wide areas of Siberia, there's likely to be a, uh, 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 a change in vegetation. What's important about that is that uh, these evergreen conifer albedo uh, is much lower than the larch albedo. So here's where you're going to get a very uh, possible interaction with, uh, with climate. And that seems to be happening right now. So I think that I'm just going to uh, I was very, uh, way over optimistic and get to the conclusions. Yeah, well, it's way optimistic. Okay, so it, it, it was not faster than I was doing it myself. Agent based approach has been integrated into spatially explicit modeling to provide more mechanistically based descriptions of land cover dynamics. Scaling up from individual plants to landscape and regional scales allows applications to issues such as climate change. However, it's essential to include crucial mechanisms that occur at the local scale of individuals. Okay, thanks. Based on your observation that the tree growing kind of look like, like do you see, uh, that, that seems to me that you, you, you're saying you cannot just take the average coverage. Average coverage is not necessarily the good uh, proxy to have this vegetation uh, landscape interaction, well, depending on what you're interested in. But would you have another 
anything to measure to recommend for landscape dynamics? Well, well, yeah, but I think that, and I didn't really get that in a lot of detail, but some of these models, uh, the models, you know, Landis model, the uh, Ashton Lee Formosaic Hormose, model, and these others are trying, I think they're doing a fairly really good job of scaling up so they can include what's happening at these very small scale including the, uh, the, some of the internal variability in the small scale that you'll see these, that you need to keep in, uh, that you need to keep track of to, to get a uh, good estimate of uh, biomass and productivity at larger scale. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that there must use any perfect way of doing it, unless you, 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 you model every tree. So the, the next, the, the previous presentation showed, okay, maybe this even in so very linearly with uh, um, vegetation less coverage. I don't know if it was just uh, like one one average value of this. So it's, it seems to say something different about that. Yeah, I don't have to know what, what different. I don't understand quite understand what you're asking. But, we can talk Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I haven't, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a good preview over the whole, uh, uh, all the modeling that's been done, but I, I don't know how much uh, that changes in the landform uh, have incorporated in, into these models. It, 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 it could be very important. We're, I work in the, in the Everglades, uh, in the, the mangrove areas where we're, we're getting changes in uh, elevation through time because of sedimentation and uh, uh, and it uh, also changes uh, uh, as lower levels in the region zone. And that's, that's going to have an effect, but we haven't tried to uh, take, that, take that into account yet. It's good for long term, uh, it's good for the long term. Thank you very much.